Sarah came on our radar through Stuart Armstrong for the exceptional work she was doing for UK Coaching and Sport England, where Stuart is based out of, but also the work she does as a coach herself with the England under 18s women's team and also as a consultant um, with her company, uh, Flourish Consulting. And I suppose it was just through, through those discussions that we realized that we had a highly influential and a highly um, experienced practitioner um, working within our own kind of sphere. And it was, it was a very easy thing for us to hope and, and ask and connect with her to, to open our Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland conference later this April, later this month. So when we decided to go to a webinar, it was an obvious choice to ask the, the person who we'd hope to open our conference to also open our webinar series. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sarah and thank her uh, sincerely for the four of us. And, uh, and I look forward to the next 20 minutes of a presentation and then the Q&A after. Great. Well, thank you very much. And it's uh, lovely to see everyone or mostly see everyone. Um, not quite coming home to Cork for this conference, which is a shame, but uh, at least we're, we're here and, and uh, that's a really positive. I'm going to share my screen now and let me just run through. Can you see that okay? Is that yes. okay for everyone? Great. Yeah, Excellent. So just a, a little bit about me to start with. Um, first thing I'm going to do is just move this little picture van down so I can see my screen. Um, so I, that's me there in the middle, played hockey for Ireland for 10 plus years um, and captained the side. Uh, so much so I was on the cover of some you know, Irish hockey books. You can see my foot on the side of the back cover. Didn't quite make the front cover. Oh, sorry. Um, but at the end of my playing days for Ireland, I became interested in NLP, the study of excellence. Um, and through that became really interested, how could I put this into practice in coaching, hockey coaching? So I became a hockey coach um, and over time got involved with the England pathway. And I'm now in my sixth year of, of lead coach with um, England under 18s. I'm also a club coach and that's Kate and myself as two co-coaches co at a Premier League club in uh, the UK. But all along the way, um, I've had a business career. So you can see some logos down here. I worked at a company story for 10 plus years, which was very much around a storytelling. How do we tell stories for brands and use that for innovation? A truth uh, worked in consultancy around insight, strategy, research. Um, and now, uh, as Ed was saying, I, I very much work for myself and uh, run Flourish Consulting. consulting. But I also work for as associate consultant for Leading Edge, which is a leadership development, high performance um, company. So uh, there was a few questions that were asked for this presentation. So I said I'd throw a few things at us and I'm sure you, you'll have questions already, but some stimulus for, for our, our share here today. So how do we foster this development of culture um, in, I suppose, my roles in sport and business and how does it impact us as a whole person? Um, for me, I would talk a lot around those creating environments where people flourish. So the starting point really is this idea of self-determination theory is very much the heart of any cultural environment that I'd be looking to influence, create. Um, and that's really where do we create choice, autonomy within that, um, people feeling competent within their capabilities. Obviously, there's lots of stretch within that but also that they feel a sense of belonging. And I think when we have those key elements in place, we can fly as individual, or also we can fly in sync with others in, in, a, in a team situation. Over time, I've developed a flourish model, um, which is very much at the core of, of a lot of the work that I will do within a coaching, uh, but also within a business context. So very much around four pillars, one around optimism, absolutely, how do we create a winning belief system? How do we create this sense of flow? Um, but also, how do we grow this gritty resilience? And ultimately, um, how through purpose will play? Um, how can we really create mastery in our lives? And this really, if we kind of hone these four areas, we can really truly flourish to be our best self. Um, there's a load of, I suppose, uh, research that really has brought me to this place and life experiences. Um, the work that Martin Seligman and Maureen Gaffney, Irish psychologist, has done around flourishing has really informed that. Um, I've gone away and uh, studied mindfulness as a practitioner, 
but also things like behavioral economics, I think are really, really important in terms of how do you nudge your environment? How do you use heuristics to design and create your environment like priming, for instance, or peak end. Um, but I think a lot the, the research around flourishing is people truly flourish when they have the ratio of five to one. So how do we think about that when we design our environments? And it's often a really useful question to ask people in your environments. If you to think about your self talk, what's your ratio? Are you five to one? Oftentimes it's five to one and the opposite when it comes to our own self talk. And um, took this thing around flourishing so seriously, uh, went and um, bought an old rune in Italy and now I run flourishing retreats in Italy. Uh, we were due to be there in May this year, but it's not quite the time to go to Italy for a flourishing retreat. Um, but within, um, I suppose, my approach to thinking about cultures and creating environments where people do flourish, the idea of unlocking connections, imagination and creativity is very much at the heart of that. Um, and the work that Daniel Kahneman has done around systems thinking, I think, is something that really influences environments that I look to, to create. So he talks about system one and system two, um, system two being the pilot who thinks they're in control, but actually it's the autopilot that is in control. About 70, 60, 70% of our everyday decisions, habits, behavior is actually on the, on the associated um, subconscious level. Um, but what's really interesting, the language of system one is storytelling. And actually, if we can really tap into creating environments where people can trigger their best self in the everyday, storytelling can really be powerful. Um, I'm also a Lego facilitator, a serious play facilitator. Um, so I would use a lot of design to think principles, both in business, but also within a sort of sporting world. And it's a great way to unlock, unlock creativity. And, and just going back, I suppose, it's interesting because um, system thinking is, is relatively new from a neuroscience point of view, but Tim Galway, uh, a sort of hero coach of mine, um, was talking about it in the 70s. He called it self one and self two. And actually, there's an inner and an outer game. And actually, it's really the inner game that often is the thing that scuppers us. Um, and he's usually influenced me. And I think his formula really, I, I, you know, within an I, environment where you're looking to create high performance, as a coach or a facilitator, how can I increase potential but remove interferences? And I kind of hold that on the top of my head often when I'm coaching, but obviously when I'm creating environments as well. So we would do a lot of work around what are the interferences? What are the stuff that's getting in your way? We talk about gremlins. What are the gremlins? You know, those self-talk and actually personifying those and being a bit more playful is a great way to start taking it a bit lighthearted. But actually, once you start noticing them, they start losing their power. This is some of the under 18s here. They like snipe self-doubt and Lola the lost gremlin. Oh, there's Lola turning up again. And it just, it just sort of changes the dialogue with yourself. But thinking about unlocking potential, we have to have a strength. If we're looking at the interferences, we also need to think about how do we play to our strengths? Um, so we'll do a lot of work around character strengths. Martin Seligman's 24 character strength survey is a great thing to work with a team environment. And People can again build them you know, through Lego or creatively through mood boards. We've got uh, somebody here actually creating a, a little movie around zest is best and, um, and creatively we get to know each other uh, within that environment. I have zesty but, interpretation of my character strength and I interpret it as having a positive attitude and a growth mindset. So he doesn't have a name. But just a little. But I think ultimately, if we're creating cultures where people really flourish, we need to know what story we're telling and actually bring everybody on that story. What's the narrative you're telling and actually capture those stories and those experiences because you want people to really feel and live that journey, that story, but feel that they're part of the dreams that they're creating uh, within it. And I suppose ultimately, within a culture, if we can work to our higher purpose, and um, we look a lot about this within business, so the work I do with Leading Edge, we will work with clients around highly effective teams, they really know their higher purpose, but you as an individual knowing your higher purpose, um, so this is one uh, a key part of my purpose, and I know it's really around people flourishing, but I have a real desire to support females to flourish. Um, my Lego build over here, um, I use Lego to help me find my purpose. And when you go to our treats in Italy, we'll use Lego in that way as well. Um, this is a, the picture down here is actually a US, at the US field hockey. I was there before Christmas and we had a, a female coaches event. 
So really then, um, the power of self-expression, the sort of next question was really, how do you develop and foster creativity in a psychologically safe environment? Um, so, so one of the things we do within the England setup is, um, and I, I probably robbed this idea from John Wooden, his pyramid of success, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to steal good ideas. Um, but we create very much um, different themes that we layer across the season. So the, end, the, the very starting point is play fast, play forward, play hard. But that very first camp, we'll have a storytelling camp where people share their stories and you get to know people and their vulnerabilities through sharing their personal stories. And the key thing that's important to that is that we really listen to each other's stories and people feel valued as part of that. And uh, our pyramid here, we you know, what's kind of at the heart of it and is this idea of love or togetherness that holds it all together through that, that process. Um, I'll just play a little clip here, if it works. Is it working okay? Yeah. This is us um, playing in the semi-final of the Europeans against Germany. Um, just some of our principles here. Lovely 2v1, deception, that kind of get ahead. Um, so really thinking about layering your principles. And uh, there we, you have to teach people to kind of celebrate goals, but they seem to get there eventually, you know. So, but early on in the process, we do a creativity camp, and this is really, or, or really important in the process, particularly I think with girls who often are afraid to make mistakes and take risks. And um, we need to know to be confident. Confidence is all, all around taking risks and growing through that process. It's around action, um, so opening people up to try things. We'll look at the science of creativity and then we'll create an environment that's full of play and we'll celebrate mistakes because they're things that we can learn from. We'll do this at a club level as well. We've got Wonder Woman Wednesday um, where we are really playful, looking at a whole lot of constraints within that environment. But at the heart of this is the idea of flow um, and you know, I think if you look at this model, uh, I think it captures it brilliantly. It's based on years of uh, longitudinal research that actually when are people mo at most they're happy is when they're in flow, when they're in sync between skill and challenge. Um, however, to really grow and to, um, to kind of push ourselves on, we have to be at the edge. We need to really get on the edge of that comfort zone. Um, and so as a coach, I think you're always looking at how do I create an environment where I'm, I'm putting people in that place of, of being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I kind of often talk about sort of the, you know, 70, 30, you know, you need to have that whole base of safety and then you have permission to really challenge people, but it has to come from that safety. They talk around that sort of safe uncertainty. Um, but within that, it's around really knowing when are you at your best, when are you at your worst, how do we create strategies that allow people to understand that and to know each other as people. Um, we run a lot of scenario camps, um, so we will run a finding flow camp and the chaos camp. Um, and this is to set us up for when chaos does come our way. And um, so this year we were playing against Ireland in February and we Coaches didn't turn up for meetings. We got them to swap sticks, um, told people they weren't playing. And then at the last minute they were playing and just threw chaos and curveballs at them. And then last year we were going out to play the Dutch and there was glass all over the picture and it was no problem for the players. They were well able to kind of occupy themselves and they knew exactly what they needed to do to stay in the game. Um, I'll leave that one actually, but it's a... So I think the what if scenario, you know, obviously COVID-19, Olympics, road to Russia. Um, we, we were due to go to Russia for Europeans in July. So we had Think Kazan. We've now changed it to road to Kaizen, which is the idea of continuous improvement. It's Japanese philosophy. Uh, having worked for Lexus Toyota for 10 years, something I'm, I'm well attuned with, but actually now we're reframing this to our idea of constant, continuous improvement, small steps that we can make over this lockdown period to create transformational change. Um, and so kind of lastly, the sort of question was around how do we unlock the power of um, helping young people develop skills? And I probably talk around how purposeful play is really at the heart of this. Uh, Bo Lotto, I, I, a lot of time for his work around um, understanding perceptions, but he talks about play as really this celebration, 
it's this uh, openness, corruptive, but it's essentially intrinsic. So if we think about the environments we're playing, where it's actually intrinsically motivated, this purposeful play, you know, I, I play, I play, I play, I paint, I paint, I weave, I weave. You're in the moment. You're just loving the thing for itself. Um, this picture of dolphins is basically dolphins play all life long with no, no output for the sake of play. Um, and we do play sport. Um, so it should be the heart of everything we do. So I kind of think about this sort of my map of the world. And I think as coaches, we need to think about where we're playing. Um, are we in this sort of setting up a system that's dynamic or chaotic? Or are we going into more isolated tasks? I would definitely have a bias to be more in the chaotic player led. So I need to recognize there's times when I need to go to task and coach led and just knowing what's, what session I'm designing or where am I in my planning? Am I in this playground? Because there's times it's absolutely right to be coach led, but there's times it's absolutely right to be player led uh, within that. So, um, Another thing I've robbed along the way, thank you, London Irish, but I thought this was really good. So like, where do you play mostly? And, and this is for us as coaches, you know, uh, block, block practice, small-sided games. Um, are we more a meta condition where we're doing more like computer game levels and power-ups or tactical challenges? And where are you pulling from in your sort of repertoire in terms of how your session planning is working to really maximize that experience for players? So I would probably um, really think and, you know, argue that actually sport is chaos and actually, you know, decisions, weather, tactics, things come at you and how we make sense of it is really personal. It is individual and it is implicit. So to really create environments where players can taste this and live this is us ultimately helping them to be, you know, proficient as sports people. Um, and those learnings that you take on the pitch, you can take obviously into life. Um, so principle-based coaching is very much at the heart of this. So um, very much in terms of when I think about, you know, skill, skills and the development of skill, um, very much think we are in a dynamic system. It is complex and we need some simple rules to make sense of that complexity. Um, if we're looking to create game sense, that's really about creating order out of chaos. And um, it's around helping players to make meaning and allow learning to emerge and be owned. So through, a la like through that layering proce process of developing skills and game sense, you learn over time. It's not like you can just crack something in a weekend or over a short period. And to know that actually it might emerge for one player now and it might emerge a year later or two years and to just go on that journey. But at the heart of that is if you are looking and searching and discovering, you have to value mistakes. You need to know that that's going to be the, where the rich stuff happens. And so as a, what's the coach's role? Our role really is about identifying the principles, manipulating the system, and really enabling players to be creative and to own their own journey. So I very much see a coach as a facilitator, I suppose an influencer. Some of, so can we guide our players to solutions, direct their attention, help them make meaning, but that they really own it through that process. And for us to do that, we need to have guiding principles. So at England Hockey, um, we very much have guiding principles at that higher level that, that really set, set our kind of, I suppose, our, our end in mind in place. And within business, we talk a lot about the end in mind as well. The idea of start with why and push off and with business, we might talk about design principles that really define the space. Um, but to do that in a way that allows people to find a way to win, how do you create environments that it's, it's not just about the outcome, it's the process of, of getting to that outcome. Um, and so this, this is just sort of an example of something we might do within the under 18 environment. Um, we would get players to pick their favorite, their favorite player in the world um, who is, uh, and have um, really get a, maybe even just share on WhatsApp a link of that player and actually a skill they're executing that's in their individual development plan. And then they'll come together as a group and they'll design a practice around that. And so that actually, so here we've got, uh, we've got a flow, like uh, playing forward from pockets when under pressure and um, there's some brilliant give and go clips here. And then how do you design that, that practice? And 
we'll end up saying, okay, here's some things, stimulus that you can use, whether it's challenge cards, priming, vision is key to flow. So Ronaldo's great vision, we might unpick how he does that and play some football. And then within it, uh, create games that actually are in that sort of chaos area with lots of decisions that are making. So level one, level two, level three. So put in your levels, co-create it, give the game a name, give it a scoring um, and keep switching their attention. I suppose the, the, the real finding around flow as well is that to keep people's attention, there needs to be always twists and turns. So how do you develop those into your coaching? Um, and as coaches, you know, you're helping your players to grow awareness when those twists and turns are happening and how can they create them. So things like pauses are great for this so they can pause the game and move everybody around to maximize the scoring, um, get things like um, superpower bands and who you're going to give it to and it can completely change the game. And it just keeps ramping up the find a way to win mentality, the intensity of it. So that's pretty much pretty much me. I mean, I've, I've raced through a number of different things there, but aware of the time. Um, so my, my very much my mantra is through effort comes magic. And I think, you know, players, part of our role in a, in a coaching environment is very much around to inspire people to go away and do the hard work, but to, to kind of make the um, effortful, effortless through that process. And actually the magic will come from that process. Um, and so I think around growth, growth mindset or being gritty, um, actually these are attributes that are absolutely going to stand to us in life because I know success comes through that, that, that effort that we can put in. It's not always the most talented that succeed as we know. So I hope that's given you a bit of a flavour. Um, I'll see if I... Ali, you might stop the um, share for me. Thank you. That's great, Sarah. Thank you so much. I might, I might just kick off the questions um, while uh, Phil and Alan maybe filter through some, some of the questions that have come in from online. Um, I, I have loads, so I'm, I, I'm going to try and prioritize as best I can. And the first thing that, that jumped out at me, um, because your, your, your philosophy, your approach seems incredibly encompassing for the individual, that it, it's very welcoming, let's say. And I just want to, I, I suppose I'd like to know how do you get that balance between, as you say, we, we want people to not be afraid of making mistakes, that you actually get from that point where they actually value mistakes. Another thing you said, how, what are the, I suppose, what are the early interactions that you have with your players to get them to move away from that? Because a lot of people, certainly in my experience, when I go in a deep dive with athletes, is that they've grown up around this idea of fear of failure. And I'd like to know, what are the early things that you do to break them away from that, that thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, absolutely. I think that the way the environment's designed is very much with that in mind. So as I said, from very much early on, even the idea of creating an environment where it's just um, be yourself. So by sharing each other's stories and as coaches, we'll share stories where we've probably been quite vulnerable as well. Um, like sometimes I'll meet the group and I'll just say, you know, the first time I went to a um, an Irish trial I actually forgot my hockey stick and I was really embarrassed you know and I might tell a story like that you know and it's just I'm trying to get a human connection from the very outset we purposely have play fast play forward play hard at, at the bottom because there's nothing massively technical around that but it's just come on let's just go out there and play and we'll talk about play and then we'll go into uh, a camp all around creativity and it's celebrate, like when somebody makes a mistake and they're trying something they're working on, we're like, whoa, yeah, that's brilliant. You know, and it's like, did you see what you just did? It didn't come off, but did you see what you just did? And we'll put clips of those. And, and then the key thing is that you've got to walk that talk the whole way through that journey because you're, you're not going to change people's minds in, in you know, the first two months. It's, it's the walking and the talking of that. And when it comes to the crunch, and you're 2-1 down against Germany, are you still holding yourself true to that philosophy? Now you are, you are getting them to start dialing up understanding risk reward as you go through that process, but if you don't go and play the pendulum of just give it a go, don't worry too much around the risk bit initially, because most people play it safe. So unless you yeah. kind of change that pendulum, um, and then we'll start going, okay, now when's the moment to do this and when's the moment to do that? But this, like with the, um, 
England team, it is development. So, you know, actually the, the, the risk of mistake ultimately is something they may take learning into the future. But I would argue actually taking risks is at the heart of creative, exciting, unpredictable hockey. And we should all play along that spectrum in any case. Um, I, I think there's that. more upside than downside. Yeah, no, I love that. I, 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 again, I, I have many more, but I, I know there's a lot of questions, see quite a lot of questions coming through. So I'll, I'll go to Ali, I, to, uh, to Phil and Alan to see if, what, what ones they've, they've chosen from the, the, those that have come through online. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks very much, Sarah. I said there's, there's a massive number here and I'm going to try and, and not dig into my questions and, and hopefully we'll get a load of questions coming in from the floor. Um, first one, actually, I'm going to swing to, to David Sharkey. So David just posted one through and we might actually get David to ask you the question just in case there's any follow-up or any context that he wants to add to that. Um, so David, I don't know if your mic is there. Are you happy to, to jump on and just ask Sarah your question directly? I'm oh, sorry, David Stevens. Sorry, David Stevens. David, I've just unmuted you, so you're good to go there. Oh, you're legend, thank you. <laughs> I'll have to go back and see what it was then now. <laughs> All right, where was it? I'm scrolling back through, scrolling back through. Oh, yeah, so it was, um, it's about the celebrating from, because I, I, I'm loving the fact that you, you're talking about the fact that you're celebrating the mistake. But how do you, you know, is there a way that you set parameters around this in, term, in terms of, um, you know, they're going to go out and make, make, make mistakes deliberately? Can you go too far the other way with it in terms of that? And then also then, how would you sort of back up the learning from it? And would there be something you would do prior to the session to set this up? Yeah, I mean, um, absolutely. So, I mean, I think one of the key things you want to do is people have to have a feeling of success. So, like, if you just fail, fail, fail and not have a taste of success, it, it isn't as much fun. So you do need to have, you need to create the environment where you're going to feel that sense of success as you go through that as well. So there's times where you'll put them in situations like a high chaos situation that success might be low out of this, but they might find, they hopefully find a way to win through that process. And there are a lot of times when you might just make it sort of, you know, you just change the dynamic a little bit and success will come more easily. I mean, you just have to read what's happening in the situation around that. Um, I think the key thing around this is it's really is that pendulum swing. Unfortunately, so many people are afraid of making mistakes. I do think we have to go out here. But the key thing is helping people to learn. And you do a lot of role modeling. So we would take a lot of players in who will talk about their journey. Um, we'll prime people with clips beforehand and stories of people who use this approach, but how it's made them successful over time. So, you know, it's not about accepting low standards. Absolutely not. It's actually around the curiosity because oftentimes the learning is lost if you're just giving yourself a hard time because you've made a mistake. You're in this, uh, I've done it again, rather than going, actually, what happened here? Um, what was it I did? I'm being curious. So we might put them in buddies. And let's say you and me, David, we're buddy, and I, and I make a mistake. And you, we afterwards will have a chat about it. Maybe even when we're on the pitch, did you notice you did that again? All right, thank you. So how do we create more seeing eyes and have people around you to help you? So our buddies will have our, you know my IDP goal and what I'm working on, and I'll know yours. And every time I try it, I tick a box and you get points for your team. So you gamify it as well. So, um, but you're absolutely right. You do have to see where you are on that and make sure you get a sense of success in there as well. Is that okay? That's great. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, David. Thanks, uh, thanks Sarah. Um, so we've had another question come in, which I imagine actually quite a few people are thinking because a lot of this is around creativity and creativity is often associated with um, attacking players. Um, so Sean Kremen, Sean, do you want to, to come in and, and ask your question directly? I said just to that'll give you the opportunity to ask any follow-ups or any extra context that we need as well. Sean, I've, I've unmuted you there, so you should be good to speak. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yes, yeah, so look, thanks, sir. Some very uh, interesting content. Uh, so, look, I think Phil kind of briefly mentioned it. There's a lot of focus on the like attacking play and creativity. Just kind of curious to know from like a more like a player's perspective or from like the all-around coaching team, 
would there be any kind of like fight back or backlash from like the more defensive minded players kind of saying like oh this is great we're all having lots of fun but they're creative and scoring goals but just kind of curious to know again from the whole team perspective is there any kind of backlash or like any objection from the more defensive minded players kind of to see or, or what, what are we going to do if the ball is turned over etc yeah I mean yeah I, I mean I think uh everyone is a defender, everyone is an attacker. I think making that clear from day one is, is really important and we've got responsibilities on both sides. Uh, we'll talk a lot about transition play. Um, so what do you do when we lose the ball? How quickly can we win it back? Our strategies and thinking around that, how creative can we be? We talk about a wolf pack mentality. How do we, how do we trap players? How do we set traps for opposition? So I think creativity uh, you know, is, is definitely not just around that fluidity in attacking mode absolutely how you dominate how gritty you are how how do you uh create pressure i think if you think about that if you are being pressed by an opposition and it's just like a wave after wave of rel relentlessness that in itself is a creative act how you do that and how you enjoy doing that so so absolutely i think they have to go hand in hand and you know, you will be better on the ball if you're better off the ball. So the, the amount of pressure that you put on and the grittiness that you have and the, you know, the, because we know perceived pressure makes a massive difference. You know, I've just got to, it's just often perceived. So how do you play with putting pressure on people through, through just affecting their per per perceptions, your voice, your stick, your body language, how you stand, your ankle. I mean, I think we've got to celebrate creativity you know whether it's taking the ball off the line all of these aspects you know um, being on the post being able to do you know cricket shots yeah. off here that you got to love both sides so good question thank you thanks very much uh sean um so we've got a question now coming in i'm going to switch over to, to david sharkey um, if anybody hasn't come across the work that David Sharkey's done around stories, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, and so his, his question relates to that as well. So, uh, David, when you're ready, I'll let you jump on. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Sarah, yeah, I'm particularly interested in, in storytelling and, 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 and theming. So your aspect of uh, how you tell stories both within business and, and within sports teams is, is really, really interesting to me. Now, you mentioned, for example, how you invite players to share their stories and you look to share your own as a way of connecting with them. If, if that's more concerned about the past and the beginnings of those stories, how do you, how do you then look to the future about writing that story together as a, as, as, as a, as a team? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we talk about our story, our journey, our dreams. Um, and I'm absolutely, I think we are wired for stories. Um, we trigger, we can trigger our best through the stories that we tell. So part of it is, is really around creating space um, for players, um, for people to fill those stories. But if you put the parameters around um, and the principles um, around that, I think people are massively creative. So we do have a storytelling team um, and um, they come up with such brilliant uh, just capturing of key moments. Because I think the key thing as well is every camp you're creating content and how are you turning that content into stories that you retell, that capture the principles, but also remember, you remember the experience you have, so you're re-triggering the learnings that you have through the stories that you're telling. So I'm just always mining for stories. I'm always mining for moments that's gonna make a good story. And how can I storyfy my content? Uh, you know, even using mantras like, you know, through effort comes magic. Those kind of, that kind of richness of language, you really trigger is that sort of system one part of our brain. So um, it just, I think it's in the everyday and it's really around also identifying people within the team who are really just good natural storytellers and, you know, young people now particularly are brilliant at Instagram and video and all of these kind of things. So um, the amount of content they're even creating at the moment as we go through this period of time is, you know, we've got an express yourself competition going on. And some of the stuff they're doing is brilliant. And it brings a smile to your face and, and there's a joy to it. But there's also then the idea of belonging. You feel part of something. And I think that's what story does. You see yourself in the story and I see my teammates in the story and I belong here. Um, and I'm kind of implicitly learning about the experience that we're having all the time. Brilliant, thank you. 
Great. Thanks, I'm going to jump in quickly and ask a question from James Weldon, who apologises as he's got a lot of background noise going on. Um, but he's curious as to how your concepts are in, um, fit in with the other age groups in the development squad, so the under 15s, under 16s, under 70s, um, and if there's a massive change for those athletes when they come to you guys. Yeah, no, so I think... Um, we, we very much within England hockey have our end in mind principles and a lot of underlying understanding of what we're looking to achieve. Um, as coaches, we spend a lot of time sharing and talking throughout that process. Um, yet the coaches can also bring their own philosophy to it because I think it's really important that you as a coach can express yourself and your philosophy within a, a principle-based approach. Um, I think it's around knowing that it needs to be different as well, under 16 to under 18 to under 21, ED, like the elite development squad. At this age, you're really helping them to start becoming independent learners, learning to learn. Um, you're helping them to really own their journey. Um, you're helping them to inspire, to want to go away, to work harder themselves. Um, so you want to start getting them to start taking real ownership and also find their voice. So I feel often when the players go up to the next level under 21s and seniors, they're really confident in themselves in terms of they're confident to speak out, they can analyse hockey, they can talk about it and they know what they're working on and how they're working on it and they know why they're doing it and they know actually, you know, staying true to the joy of why you're doing it I think is really important. So I think you're helping them at a certain point in time in their life and understanding what needs are, are really important around that. So things do need to be different but still connected and aligned. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and we do have a lot of questions coming in, so we're trying to filter through them as <laughs> yeah. we to try and get to everyone's. Um, if we want to jump to uh, Warren Abraham next, if that's okay. Hi, Sarah. <clears throat> Obviously very biased towards this type of culture. Um, so yeah, now I just got a quick question. How do you create competition amongst, your, amongst the athletes? Um, so obviously it's, it's, it's one thing that I've sort of struggled with a little bit over with my team, with the American team that I'm currently coaching. So yeah, I'm curious, especially coming from a, ma a male game into the female environment. Um, that's probably the one biggest thing that I've learned where it's incredibly hard to create that level of competition amongst the individuals. Yeah, and I agree. Some teams, some groups are easier to get there than others. Some groups are just naturally have it in. And are there some leaders that really, you know, bring the group with it? So um, we, we, because we put a wrapper, so we have a grit camp come, you know, we should have been having it live, you know, in the next few weeks, but we'll be having it virtually now. So a grit camp is maybe a camp you would not like to come to physically, mentally, but everyone will be put into teams and they'll be competing individually and as a group. Um, but often, you know, the key thing is around uh, creating an identity. So, so we might have like a Super Sunday Europeans and actually the end, we're ending up looking to win the Europeans this weekend. Um, and so there may be a trophy at the end of it or there's going to be definitely a celebration that you're going to know that you've won this. So I think putting that in place, so putting them in teams, getting them to name their teams and then making everything they do, every score count. So we'll often have a, a competition board, you know, round one, whatever it is. And it might start with the running, it might start with whichever, round two, and we keep the, the points going. It might be over three, three days, it could be over the whole program. You keep up a, a level of competition uh, within it. But ideally also start identifying the people who have this natural um, way of bringing everybody with them and start priming them to lead. Um, and hopefully they're doing it already, but sometimes young people but might just need some support. It's, it's okay to be quite tough with people at this point. Um, but if you also just keep adding fun into it, enjoyment, so, you know, you, know you, you just have to think about creative ways to make, keep stimulating the environment. Actually, this really counts. And you really do see where teams start clicking, where actually a scenario, they really want to win a scenario. Now, there's only two minutes left of the game and you're 2-1 down, you know, how are you going to find a way to win here? And it's as meaningful as the moment in the Europeans. So when in the Europeans they're in that situation, they've been there, done that uh, within the game. So just getting them into scenario-based mindset and bringing them on that journey. Um, but I, yeah, it's, 
it's definitely there's no straight answers I think there's a lot of just finding what's right for a certain group at any one time as well Warren so but happy to follow up with you on that as well if it's helpful uh, definitely thank you very much appreciate it uh, that, that's great. I think the questions are fantastic. So uh, really keep sending them in. We'll try and pack in as many as we can. Um, I'm going to go over to, to Adrian Geisel next. So uh, over to you, Adrian. Ooh, um, uh, hi, sorry. Yeah, I'm un unmuted now. Uh, Sarah, listen, um, really good presentation, great discussion. Um, I'd like to come back a little bit to the map of the world, the, the grid where um, you positioned yourself or, or mainly up in the upper right quadrant. I suppose the question I'm looking at is that's age appropriate or age sensitive. So how does that positioning change and at what stage would you sort of look at transitioning more into that quadrant as opposed to, you know, if you're dealing with under eights or, or a really young group, then obviously you're going to be squarely stuck in the lower left. So just your thoughts on that, please. Really interesting. I think I think what I would say is I'm not, not necessarily up there. I'm aware of my bias, that that's where I like to go a lot. And sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. So I need to just, you always just need, as coaches, we may have biases and just being aware of them. Um, I, if the game is ultimately a game of chaos and people need to be able to play that, I think from day one, you need to go to that quadrant. So I can go out in the garden quite now and create a chaos environment for my eight-year-old boy where he's doing loads of implicit learning um, and you know he's learning how to ball protect we'll, we'll play football and we've got a crazy catch in the middle and we've got a ball each different sizes so there's variability so he's learning to ball protect he's learning to keep the ball at his ends and we're playing loads of scoring so you know if he can kick my ball away I kick his it's minus one plus ones and kids get scoring really easily and actually if you ask them then what's the next level of this game and so his next level was actually if we can kick the ball from one end to the other, um, you know, from over distance, we get a bonus, you know, and it needs to go in target. And so I think, you know, and then you can put a super, uh, superpower band on and say, now, if you, you know, do your skill when you're wearing this for two minutes, whatever it is, you've nutmegged me or whatever you can. So all the time he's, he's just looking at different stuff. So I think you can go into that quadrant as a young age but there's times then like everything that they they do need to you know get some more isolated skill stuff as well so um that really just helps them you know like how do you hold a stick or actually you know but, but equally i think some of that learning will emerge through through their process you know and you don't need to crack things straight away and different players will just come to understanding you know whatever age at certain points so trying to trying to see where that group is or that, those players and um, going on that journey with them, I think is important. But I think dipping into those areas is really important. You know, all, all part of that map from day one, I think is really important. Kids play computer games all the time, so they get that whole idea of setting missions and targets and, you know, superpowers and that kind of thing. And, you know, my club team who are, you know, grown women in, in a corporate world actually like to be Wonder Woman sports people as well. So I think it, it can tra travel, play can travel all ages. And we need, we need more celebration of play. And we do a lot of work now, more work on that in business as well. So uh, we learn a lot about life through that, I think. So yeah. I hope that's been helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm actually going to be a little bit selfish here and jump in and, and give uh, give one of my own questions. Um, you mentioned <laughs> it, it is it definitely is. We're taking that. Um, you mentioned learning to learn, which is yeah. something I'm, I'm I'm really passionate, really serious about. But I also recognise there's quite a lot of coaches uh, in the room who are working with younger age grades than you are, and I know you're you're mostly working at that that older adolescent development age, transitioning through. Um, but could you comment on learning to learn at younger age groups? So when you see that coming in in development and how you see that feeding all the way through the development pathway? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm definitely in the younger age group at the moment in lockdown with my eight-year-old son, spending every minute of the day with each other. Um, you know, and I, I think he gets a lot of feedback from his teachers in the school that he's a very independent learner. And I think that's something that we set out as parents from a very young age to, to to really create that environment. Um, and I think uh, creating love of what you're doing um, 
helping people, young, you know, young people to be curious, uh, stimulating them, giving them stimulus. So like we, myself and Caelan watched um, the Irish documentary this week around uh, the, the Irish legends and he watched it from start to finish. And so how do you give them stimulus that, uh, that really excites them? Um, I don't think we do enough of it. So I would have an iPad on the side of the pitch and, you know, with young kids and I might show them some, oh, look at this clip. This is really interesting. Should we try this? And we're, you know, some kids are visual learners and just, I'll, I'll video you. But you yeah, oh, you're going to wear the go banana band now. And if you do your thing, you have to go bananas and I'll show you the video of you doing it. And so I think there's just lots of creative ways to engage them. And what did you notice there? How did you see it? And, and actually, sometimes you want to tell them the answer. And I know as coaches, that's always our thing, isn't it? You, you kind of you ask the question, they don't come up with it. And then you're like, uh, I'll tell. But just leaving that space of unknowing and being okay with that for a period of time so they come to the answer themselves. And I think sometimes kids, they turn off when you start telling them too much anyway. You know, whereas if you create a stimulating environment that they're just implicitly learning, um, but that you're recognizing where they are and you keep dialing up that kind of engagement I think it's 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 really having a young son now I'm actually I'd love to get into younger coaching I'm, I'm like really excited about it so uh, I love going to his football he's got a football for fun academy he goes to and a lot of the um, coaches there are ex-arsenal and I just love watching all of their practice designs I rob stuff all the time so uh, I th yeah so good question thank you thanks Bill I'm going to follow the selfish note that Phil has said. <laughs> my own question as well. Um, I, I have about seven questions that I'm going to try and boil into one, I think, because my mind is going a little bit around the bend on some of the things. Um, so you talk quite a lot about psychological safety. Um, and I think my follow-on for that is when you deal with characters who aren't willing to embrace the chaos. So you talk about your son being quite an independent lear learner. Um, or you talk about athletes who will come into the group who won't be very much open to the idea of being thrown into those chaotic situations that you create, like having them to switch their hockey sticks or the coaches not showing up to um, particular meetings. Um, and you have your leaders in the team who will kind of take over anyway. Are you happy to allow those leaders take over in those settings once you've created enough psychological safety? Or do you want to push those athletes who are a little bit chaos averse? So I think the key thing I, I would sort of talk about is the idea of pace, pace, lead. I think if you throw people into challenge too early and they're not quite ready for it, they go into that sort of anxiety piece. Mm -hmm. Whereas the idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think you have to take them to a journey. So I think there is, you know, even by doing a creativity camp early on, you know, it's just there isn't that much challenge beyond you trying stuff. I mean, that shouldn't really be challenged, but it is, unfortunately. But then actually throwing it into scenarios where you're just making them feel uncomfortable, you know. Um, so one player, she was only told five minutes before and she was playing in an international as we we're going out to the pitch. So she had 40 minutes, she had to get her shirt on. And we're saying these things could happen. You could be, you know, it could be a player that's called up and that was quite uncomfortable. Um, and she would have been, wouldn't have been one of the players that was there previously. So it was quite a new experience for her. We didn't pick somebody who was, she obviously dealt with it really well, but it, it also threw her. But that's, but you're giving that player some support while she's in that sort of state at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that um, with the program like this, you've got um, players who've been there the year before and new players coming in. So the players the year before set the tone and they help the other players. And then you see new leaders emerging and you're just keeping your eye out for when it's the right time to throw that player into being the leader and asking the other player maybe to do less. So you, you, your aim with leaders is to create everyone as leaders. And anytime you create leadership teams, they know their job is to create a team of leaders. And I think being really explicit about that is really important um, through that process as well. Brilliant, thank you. I uh, just had a, a question here from, um, from Frank. Phil, do you wanna, do you wanna over to you for that? Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm just um, trying to try and phrase this uh, a little bit differently, possibly to open it up a little bit more. Um, so the key question that Frank was asking um, is about the end point that you're looking to get to with your teams. So you know, what's the, what's the ideal? 
you go with this team and, and I guess um, when they're, they're performing as a senior team, what's the balance between player-led, between cooperative? What's the coach input in that, that end vision you have of how the team functions? Yeah, and I, I think it does definitely vary by team and like where you are in their, um, I suppose, their development as well. So um, obviously with under 18s, the, the end game ultimately is transitioning players ready to go to the next level. That's your ultimate looking of success. Uh, winning games and uh, tournaments is about teaching them ways to win, learning how to win. Um, so it's not about the winning in itself, it's the process of, that's really important, but um, we know that if you get a taste of winning, you want more, it's a good thing too, so you want to create that competitive edge um, within it. At a club level, so we're looking at, um, so we just got promoted up to the Prem um, this year, and we, we were second all the way to the end, we pipped at the post for lost by third place by one point, um, but with that group, they set out very clear goals that they wanted to be top four and they've set out very clear goals that they want to go to Europe and they've set very clear goals that they never want to lose their sense of togetherness as a group and they want to be um, a real humble and um, considerate group of people. So our job with Kate and myself as co-coaches is then to hold them account to that but then to hold themselves account to that and our job is to be facilitators of their journey to the goals that they've set um, and ultimately, they, it's, you know, if the players don't you know, really feel they own the vision for their team, they're not going to buy into it. Even though the club may have, and the club has high ambitions and uh, you know, the players know they're part of a higher vision, but they have to really own that. And we've transitioned from going into Prem, which is another level. We haven't probably got all our behaviours at the point that need to go to the next level, but you can't force those onto a group either. They have to go on that journey to finding their own behaviours to be able to take that sustainable success over time. But you know, you're talking about you know, uh, very successful women here who have massive big jobs and they come training two nights a week, they work hard, they do their video, they play at the weekend, they're committed to this group and it's so healthy and so good for you. Um, but our job as coaches is to facilitate them toward their goals. Um, through that process. So in that case, yeah, it's, it's very player led, but the coaches want you to lead them at times as well. And there's times where like, actually, guys, you need to work this out. They just want the answers because they've been used to that. And we're like, actually, we're going to have to work these principles out together. And it's just about co-creating how we want to be. And that can be a change, particularly for older players who mightn't have had that experience. Younger players are easier to just bring on that journey. Great. Um, everyone, we'll keep it running for another five minutes. So if you do have any uh, more questions, please send them through on the chat. Uh, I'll be selfish now and ask a question um, to Sarah. Um, Sarah, there's, there's probably a lot of people um, who, who have athletes who are on this call who can't access facilities very much. You know, I'm very mindful of that with working with British women. We can't get in the pool right now. I'm, I'm sure um, it's a similar situation for you uh, in your hockey roles. What what would be your general advice uh, to those people um, um, kind of on, uh, during these restric restrictions until they can get back into the, the facilities that they're normally used to? Um, I'm actually running a flourish under fire for um, the IPA, which is the Institute Protect Practitioner of Advertisers for uh, all of their kind of female members. And a big thing that we'll talk to them about is actually about being kinder to ourselves actually not giving ourselves such a hard time we're always on the go and we're going from thing to thing and actually learning to be more self-compassionate learning to actually be more aware of what we need and what we want and to we talk about this idea of kindness and actually how do you create your own practice of kindness and i think a lot of people are taking this time to step back and really reevaluate their values mm -hmm. um, and there's so much great stuff out there at the moment about about actually how do you feed your well-being in these moments um, and so even the practice of gratitude on a daily basis like standing out here now last night eight o'clock everyone's out clapping the NHS and all our neighbours and you have tears going down your face you know so so I think in adversity we can learn a lot about ourselves and to be aware of that um, I think social connection so with our under 18s we've started a virtual we've got a virtual training session tomorrow training days um, but we just keep it connected as a group and we've got a team togetherness group. We've got a, a 
um, we've got a storytelling group, how are we going to tell our story through this whole period? And so actually, how do you keep connected with people? Uh, but also, as we said, around this idea of, um, you know, road to Kazan, that's gone, road to Kaizen. How in this moment can you take small steps in the everyday to be your best right now? What is it? Is it visualization of the pool? Is it some techniques you're working on? You know, hockey players, there's loads of technical stuff that they can be work. I, l I learned so much of my hockey in the back garden. I think it's the celebration of the back garden. Again, if you're lucky enough to have one, um, you know, I think that through that sort of boredom comes creativity as well. So um, embrace it from that perspective. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, so uh, we're just going to, I think we're going to go one or two more questions. Um, I'd, be, I'd be interested to know from, from everybody on the webinar, kind of what was the one key thing that they have taken uh, from uh, the discussions and what Sarah's presented. So, you know, it'd be really great to see if, uh, if you wanted to put that on the chat function, it'd be great to see some of the things you've taken from that. And, and you know what what you're going to try and implement into your kind of uh, your your practice within your coaching but I think Phil has uh, another question to field to you I do actually but I'm going to pass you back over to Warren because I think this is a this is a really nice question to to turn the tables back a little bit so Warren if you want to jump on again a last question for you Sarah who's challenging <laughs> your thinking on a daily basis and who's making you a better coach so what was the first bit? I think I might have been laughing just saying, here you are again, Warren. But yeah. <laughs> no problem. Uh, <laughs> who's challenging your thinking um, on a daily basis? And who's making you a better coach? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, thank you very much. Good question. I'm very lucky to have a mentor who you, you know as well, uh, John Fletcher. Um, so Fletch was the England under 18 um, rugby coach for quite a number of years and so he has been a and I think I've always sought out a mentor on the way and I, I mean I think the role of a mentor is um, you know is there to challenge you but actually through the lens of being a positive support so they've got the intent is just you uh, so I, I you know and I do coach developing and mentoring work myself but I think the the real um, joy of having a mentor alongside you who can notice things and come into your environment and ask you questions you haven't thought of, I think is really, really important. Um, in terms of better coach, um, I think I would say at the moment, I think there's um, a body of us as coaches of females working hard together to see if we can all grow and develop. And um, so we have a group Project Fair Play group in the in uh, in um, England hockey, where actually a whole number of coaches, female coaches, are coming together and really asking questions of each other, learning from each other. And so I probably sought out some of that as well, and seeing the eyes through through that lens. Um, my coaches I work with are you know Kate and Lee, who works with me on the under 18s Both we just hold that space to challenge each other. So I think you need to create an environment where people around you are, are pleased to challenge you as well um, because challenge is such a positive and good thing through that particularly when it comes from that sort of positive intention and I think that's the distinction when you get that level of challenge. Thank you Warren. Okay, great good. answer, great answer. <laughs> Thanks Warren. We're getting a, a couple of take-homes. We've got uh, remembering there are four quadrants in the map of the world, the team is a wolf pack, Again, another reference to a map of the world. Um, create an environment where your leadership group understand their role. Um, building players on a, that are on a journey. Yeah, so lots coming through now. So um, thanks very much for that, Sarah. So listen, we'll, um, we'll start to wrap things up now. Um, for everybody that's on the webinar, just um, keep an eye on Movement Skill Acquisition uh, Twitter over, over uh, the coming weeks. We're, we're going to do these as a series of webinars. So we'll probably announce the next one um, towards the, the back end of the Easter weekend. Um, again, quite a number of the people that we had lined up for the conference have agreed to do one of these. Um, so it's, uh, you know, they've been very generous with the time, but Sarah, you know, certainly uh, from myself, but all I'm sure from everyone in the webinar, I just wanna thank you for your time uh, and for just sharing some of your knowledge with us today. That's, you know, it's been really, really great. Great. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I appreciate everyone taking the time and it was um, lovely to see uh, some faces on there that I know as well. And thank you for your questions. Appreciate that, everybody.